but I think it's kind of like, you know, the, the joke that I heard talking to some people there is that uh, why would you ever invest in a stock if you don't have inside information like that? That was just like, how could you be so stupid? <music> So, Keir, thank you uh, for joining us today on uh, Zeros. For those of you who don't know Keir, he's a uh, founder of uh, Scorpion Capital. He's going to be working with us at uh, Muddy Waters uh, with his new activist firm, which uh, we're extremely excited about. Let's kick this off by learning a little bit about you. Um, you know, I guess growing up, were you... Were you one of these like fanatics that walked around reading Warren Buffett when you were six, talking about discounted free cash flow and compounding, or was life a little bit more interesting for you? Uh, I think it was uh, not very finance oriented, so maybe it was a little bit, uh, hopefully, more more interesting. Uh, so I, so I'll kind of tell you the winding path that kind of led me to uh, you know being a full time short seller. I was actually born in India. I moved to the Bay Area, a suburb of San Francisco when I was uh, seven, grew up there, went to college out there. I always thought I would end up as a lawyer or as a, as a doctor, you know, with Indian parents, you know, they love the, <laughs> uh, the MD thing. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of interest in, in having a son who's a, who's a doctor. I think it was not until I actually got into business school kind of in my late twenties that my parents actually told me that, well, it's actually okay, we think, if you don't go through it. <laughs> and then in high school, I was uh, I was a debate nerd. You know, I was in the speech and debate team. I, uh, you know, some people do sports, some people are into kind of music, and you know, I was a I was a debate geek. And a lot of people that throw themselves into that activity, they tend to end up in uh, in law school. You know, so that I went med school, I actually did my pre med requirements. I think my senior year of college dabble with the idea of law school. So basically, I had no clue what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I needed to get a job. I didn't know anything about the business. I heard there was this cool management consulting firm interviewing, you know, called called Bain & Company. I crammed for interviews the night, the night before, found some books on, you know, like how to ace a consulting interview. And <laughs> shockingly, it actually it actually went pretty well. I ended up at Bain, you know, I think like the $35,000, $38,000 a year salary at the time just seemed seemed huge. So I took the job and that was kind of my entree into, uh, into the business world. I didn't follow markets, didn't dabble in stocks mm -hmm. at all. It was just, uh, uh, you know, it was kind of, I was just kind of feeling my way, you know, through uh, trying to build a career in the business world. It's funny how you, you sort of say, you know, you hadn't done it a ton in, in finance or like a huge particular interest in finance. And then you, you find yourself at Bain. I mean, I, you know, I think of like Bain, McKinsey, all these top consulting firms as like the steering hand for like the world's greatest CEOs. And then there they are with, you know, people in their like mid twenties who, who basically studied for an interview the night before. And then they're guiding like some of the largest <laughs> companies in the world you know what were you looking at who you know in terms of sector coverage and, and the kind of things your clients were asking you to do um, and I guess you know how did that experience morph into kind of you know moving into hardcore finance yeah you know the even though the Bain experience you know for me was a long time ago now I spent three years there straight out of mm -hmm. straight out of college uh, it was actually a very kind of you know formative you know experience for me, even though I had no clue what I was, you know, what I was getting into. And your comments about the model are actually funny. So, you know, the instruction there, uh, you know, if a client, CEO, somebody asks you, you know, how long you've been there, what you were instructed to say was, I'm in my first year, as opposed to, you know, two months. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, all those firms, they actually do have, you know, a pretty powerful, you know, operating model, right? So you have a partner, you have a manager. When you start, it's very task oriented. You know, doing research, doing financial models. So, and you know, you do get the opportunity to you know present to some of these CEOs, you know, right off the bat if uh, you know they think you're doing a good job. So, 
I thought it was really powerful exposure. But uh, yeah, you know, the things I learned at Bain, you know, as far as the research process, the analytic process, uh, that actually informs a lot of, you know, what I do. So the short reports that I'm publishing these days, you know, they, they kind of arguably have kind of a Bain, McKinsey, BCG kind of a feel to them. So I'm, I'm really a huge fan of, you know, of that process. And uh, I still remember the first uh, client engagement that, I was on at Bain. It was a, a lumber company called uh, Pacific Lumber. It was a notorious takeover by this guy from the 1980s, from the 1980s named Charles Hurwitz. So mm -hmm. anybody watch, you know, kind of Wall Street in the 80s, you know, he was one of these Ivan Bosky kinds of people. And I think he might have gotten into similar kinds of trouble. So he took over this company and he hired Bain to, uh, to fix it. So I was flying in a puddle jumper into these forests in mm -hmm. you know, kind of Northern California, you know, analyzing lumber mills, you know, lumber cost, visiting Home Depot stores to find out, you know, what the inventory looked like, what the pricing was. It was, uh, you know, it was lumber, but uh, you learn a lot, you know, as a new analyst by trying to pick apart these industries you otherwise would never, you'd never encounter. We have Marty Waters have had some experience with Canadian forestry companies. <laughs> I've heard. <laughs> so in addition to uh, the hostile takeover work, uh, you also spent some time with Bain in India in the late 90s. Uh, how was that? That was really interesting. Uh, the last project I worked on at Bain before I went out to business school was, uh, uh, it was for the satellite company, kind of the main satellite company at the time that carried all these channels, like, you know, CNN mm -hmm. around the world, and they wanted to enter the Indian market. And Bain at the time didn't have an India office. McKinsey dominated the market. And so they quickly put together, you know, basically, I think every Indian analyst that they had, they found three or four, <laughs> you know, that were kind of in between cases. And, you know, they had a partner and a manager, and they kind of shipped people off, you know, to be in your mid-20s, to kind of be living in these you know, very expensive five-star hotels. It was really a lot of fun and doing business in India for the first time. You know, I mean, India has changed very rapidly in, you know, the five, 10 years after that. At that time, I think, you know, Morgan Stanley had maybe four people on the ground in India. Mm -hmm. Bain, McKinsey, BCG, I think we're all working out of, you know, the Oberoi Hotel in, in Mumbai. There was a small little business center, you know, with a couple of copy machines. So, you know, the analysts are bumping into each other in the middle of the night doing their slide decks, you know, kind of looking over each other's shoulders to see what they're working on. It was, uh, you know, and, and also just a lot of, you know, lessons, uh, you know, doing doing business out there. And since then, Bain has built up a, a really successful presence from what I understand in India. I, I presume they probably have, you know, hundreds of consultants, tons of clients. But, uh, yeah, it was nice to be there. Uh, you know, as part of the, the inaugural team way back. You know, did you run into fraud there? I mean, it's it's a market that we certainly feel is um, rife with the kind of inefficiencies and certainly a lot of uh, U.S. listed companies um, that were based there have, have had accusations leveled at them. So was that such a thing back in the early 90s or was it not really things you were focusing on? So I think it's probably been a thing there since the early thousands, not, mm -hmm. just, the, uh, not just the early 90s. Uh, you know, whatever. I was like, you know, kind of a, you know, a young and dumb analyst just kind of, you know, trying to crank out buy decks. And I wasn't, you know, following any, any public companies. But, you know, as I've been a short seller, I think, uh, I think your take is spot on. You know, I, there are times when I've, you know, done screens of Indian companies trying to find things that could be interesting shorts. And, you know, it's definitely a target rich market is I think, you know, a lot of, you know, developing markets uh, <laughs> are, but I think it's kind of like, you know, the, the joke that I've heard talking to some people there is that uh, why would you ever invest in a stock if you don't have inside information like that? That was just like, how could you be so stupid? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think Mexico has a similar problem. You know, they're actually academic studies that have been done on uh, inside information, you know, stocks having these wild moves. And, you know, it just leads to the stock market not having a lot of credibility and you can't get, you know, proper capital market. So it does have a lot of ripple effects. So I think the challenge in a place like India is, sure, you know, you can come out with a report documenting fraud at a 
an Indian company. I think, uh, you know, I've talked to people there that have been involved, uh, you know, in meetings, creditor meetings, you know, with significant sized companies. People are having conversations about, you know, how they're going to cook the books. Right. So <laughs> it, it's kind of like the line from Apocalypse Now, which I think is just, you know, so many great short seller kind of allegories in, uh, in that movie. There was a line about uh, they were kind of going after this guy, Colonel Kurtz, who kind mm-hmm. of went rogue in the jungle. Martin Sheen, kind of the the narrator, said that, you know, kind of tagging life for that was like giving out speeding tickets to the Indy 500. <laughs> <laughs> that sort of, uh, you know, trying to tag people for fraud and markets like that. I don't know, you know, maybe there are stocks where you can develop such a varied perception. You know, mm-hmm. I think probably like some really blue chip stock where it's really institutional, has a lot of credibility, the stocks really run up. I think there are probably things out there that check off enough boxes where they could be interesting targets. And it's actually, you know, a fairly deep stock market. Yeah. Uh, you have tons and tons of public companies. Now, most of those are, you know, pretty small, but you have enough big ones with liquidity where I think it's, uh, you know, I think that there, there are a couple of people in India that specialize, you know, in this. I don't, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't know how successful they've been, but, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, I think there's some enterprising short seller out there who wants to really focus in. Yeah. I think there's, I think there's probably a niche to be built. So off the bane, um, you, you know, things were going well and, and then I think you made the decision to turn down several life changing opportunities. Um, (laughs) you know, you, for, for aspiring, you know, young people out there, um, there's probably no right path in life, but um, you know, th- Kira, I think you you certainly had the uh, fortune of uh, <laughs> you know <laughs> turning down some of what twenty years later would have turned out to be the greatest seats in finance. <laughs> but not to dwell on those, um, you know. So so after after Bain, what did you turn down, and, and where did you end up going? I had opportunities, but I think. Uh... I think it was three private equity firms that were, you know, one had just started. And I think all three since become, you know, some of the largest global, you know, most successful private equity firms of of all time. I think one of them offered me a seat before they had office space. I think it was just kind of like the three, you know, three founders. I wanted to go to business school. And actually think, you know, one of those, you know, it was an offer when I was coming out of business school. You know, so I've had a, a winding path that led me to being, you know, a short seller. And, you know, when I kind of look back on it, you know, a number of mistakes, you know, and lessons and lessons learned. I was too sucked into what was, you know, trendy at the time. And I was kind of mm-hmm. optimizing, you know, for short term, you know, short term games So private equity back then, you know, kind of the early to mid 90s was, uh, was very nascent. You know, these were not firms that are running, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars. Like they were interesting. I think if you worked at Bain, there were sexy places to work because there were, you know, some of the most exciting clients, you know, to kind of work on, you know, these kind of M&A due diligence situations for them. So one lesson was, that, you know, I, I just didn't have a sense of what I wanted to do longer term. And I got sucked into what was in front of me, what was trendy, which at that time was the dot com. Mm-hmm. So I, you know, had a paper in business school, uh, turned it into a company, and they're raising actually a fairly substantial amount of venture capital. And I was in Silicon Valley for six years, which in hindsight was actually a powerful experience in a lot of ways. It helped me develop a feel for what's really happening inside companies. You know, that was a pretty small company. I think we could mm-hmm. have that, you know, 60 or 80 people. You know, but having a board of venture capitalists, you know, kind of the board dynamics, all the things that happen on the inside of a company, you know, also how dysfunctional, you know, it can be. Mm-hmm. Uh you know, the lessons I learned in a 60, 80 person company, it's amazing how they can be a five, 10 billion market cap company. And it's the same shit, right? Just on a bigger scale, unless you've actually lived through it, right? So if you've always been an analyst who's kind of doing financial models on the inside, you don't understand, you know, human nature, you know, you don't understand, you know, people's incentives, the ways that they actually act when they're on, on a board and how they're incented to act. Uh, and the, the other really interesting thing from that experience is just, uh, you know, how promotional, you know, one ends up having to be it, right? So you don't raise, you know, 15 million bucks with the venture capital, you know, as a 28 year old without selling, Mm -hmm. right? And those venture capitalists don't get LPs unless they sell. You don't get clients. You don't get, you know, like superstar engineers without, without selling. And when I kind of look back on it, 
it is amazing how that promotionalism can really kind of corrupt what you say, how you think, how you act. And, you know, I mean, that was, that was an epic bubble. Everybody had, you know, instantaneous clarity about all that was wrong with it when it popped. Mm -hmm. But I still look back kind of, uh, you just kind of look at the, uh, how compromised everybody's minds were when they were living through it, you know, smart, brilliant, you know, some of the most brilliant people on the planet. Just a very good lesson in, uh, you know, just kind of how a theme, a bubble can uh, really hijack, it can hijack your brain. Did you have a CEO God complex? <laughs> uh, you know, it's funny when I when I started off as you know CEO of that company, I was actually very nervous about it. You know, like imposter complex, right? Like, how am mm -hmm. I going to get dozens of people, you know, to kind of you know look up to me? How am I going to have you know credibility, like with these very prominent you know venture capitalists on on my board? I actually got comfortable with it, you know, very very quickly. So you know, it just kind of too young to kind of have a God complex about it. But yeah, late twenties, you raise a lot of venture money. Things are going well for a while. The thing everybody wanted to do is, you know, have one of those gigs. So yeah, it kind of, kind of goes to your head. You kind of add the, you know, kind of the, kind of the arrogance and immaturity that kind of comes with being in your late twenties and you know, having come out of business school. So you know, all those all those dynamics were were at play. But the the turtleneck wasn't yet a thing. He didn't have the black turtleneck and the, the no, deep no, voice. No, no, it was. Uh, no, I I don't even think Steve Jobs was at Apple at the time. So, but uh, <laughs> had there been one, you know, I, I might have been. Maybe I would have worn one. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> so after you wrote that bubble to uh, to zero, um, you went and joined uh, Carl Icahn. You know, one of the things I, I really respect about him is he's reinvented himself multiple times from, you know, kind of an arbitrager, green mailer, corporate raider, convert bond trader, bankruptcy expert. Um, you know, what was it like there? You know, after my dot com kind of uh, journey ended, I wanted to get back on the path that I was on and I needed a way to break in to finance. Mm -hmm. I wanted to do investing stuff. And a, a good friend of mine suggested that I reach out to you know, mavericks, people that might appreciate an entrepreneurial background, people that you know aren't looking for a typical private equity hedge fund resume. And he suggested Carl Icahn. And he had actually interviewed with, with Carl and got an offer and turned him down and uh, got a meeting, You know, gave you an offer the next day. And you know, one could spend hours talking about Carl's approach, what makes him so interesting and different, you know, just seeing how his mind works, right? Just his thought process, which is so different than anything else I've ever seen, you know, even with people that, you know, are billionaires, some of the most successful investors on the planet. I mean, he's a one of a, he's a one of a kind. And, you know, he kind of has this public persona that you might see, you know, at some investor conference or, you know, on CNBC where, uh, you know, a certain amount of, you know, be a bit rough. Listen to me. I was called in by Max Meyer to have a conversation, not to argue right. with you. All right. If you if you want to take, hello. Yeah, you we're listening. Well, if you're listening, let me talk. I did. I, you know, I want to say what I want to say, and I'm not going to talk about my Herbalife position because you want to bully me. All right. I'm not bullying let, you. Let I'm asking start. the question everybody wants to know, Carl. That's all. Well, but I you can make your statement. What you want to know? I'm going to talk about what I want to talk about. And okay. if you want to take that position, I'll never go on CNBC, you know? So you can say what the hell you want, okay. but I'm going to tell you, I'm going to talk about what Ackman just said about me, not about Herbalife. And I'll talk about Herbalife when I goddamn want to, not when you ask me. You know, he's kind of a grizzled activist investor, but, uh, you know, he's a savant. And that doesn't come across, I think, in his public appearances. Sometimes, you know, like a, a super genius. I mean, the way he picks apart complex situations. You know, he was actually, I think he told me once that uh, I think he won the prize at Princeton as an undergrad for the best honors thesis. And he told me that it was, I still remember the name. I think he said it was called a, a critique of the empiricist criterion of meaning, huh. uh, you know, which is not the kind of, you know, phrasing that, you know, he uses these days, if you kind of see him on TV <laughs> or whatever, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it kind of gives you a window into his mind. And, uh, it was just a very powerful experience. You know, he's not an easy guy to work for, uh, mm -hmm. as I think, you know, people can deduce his, his personality. But, uh, and, you know, I, I wasn't there for a very long period of period of time. It, you know, it is a hard place 
to work. Mm -hmm. uh, but the things that I learned are ones that I still, you know, carry with me. Yeah. So, so look, it'd be, it'd be nice here if I, if I just let you off with, uh, you know, a few pleasantries about how brilliant uh, a billionaire is, but but what we actually want to hear is uh, <laughs> is about you getting shouted at. So, well, you know, if you didn't get screamed at there on a daily basis, it probably meant you were about to be fired. <laughs> uh, it was a good sign. There was a guy who I think had worked for him for decades, and he said, I think he was a CFO or something at the time. He said. Uh, he said, hey, how many times has Carl fired you? And he was like, I don't know, 20, 30? And he said, like, you just got to show up at work the next day. <laughs> <laughs> so he had this scrap metals recycling company at the time that he had purchased out of a bankruptcy. And I actually, you know, I was interim COO of this company. It was actually pretty sizable at, uh, at the time. Was, that was all other uh, entertaining story. Mm-hmm. And they were plugged into, you know, steel trends in China, which was a big, you know, they would move the scrap metal market, bumped into Carl in the hallway and had some data points about China. So I started pontificating about, uh, you know, China's steel demand. And he just kind of uh, paused, you know, kind of a little bit of, uh, you know, kind of, you know, theatrical silence. And he goes, Kier? I said, yes. He said, uh, are you Chinese? And uh, I said, no. And then he said, uh, well, what the fuck do you know about China? And they threw up his arms and he kind of walked down the walked away. So it was, uh, you know, his nose for bullshit is unparalleled. Yeah. Oh, you know, that's great. like a very savvy, savvy person. So many, many, many stories, uh, you know, of that ilk.